Hello, my name is Audrey Moran, and I'm here as your hostess for Audrey's Book Corner. Vermont My Book is our sponsor. And today we have with us this beautiful lady here, Crystal Good Aceves. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you. Can you uh, make your volume a little louder? Okay, can you hear me now? I hear you much better. All right. <laughs> So, Crystal, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, uh, my name is Crystal Aceves, and I have four children, married, and I love to write and do things with the family. <laughs> Sounds like fun to me. Sounds busy, too. It is. <laughs> Very busy. Your kids are how old? I have a 19-year-old, a 16-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a 5-year-old. You are busy. Yes. <laughs> no two ways about it. You definitely keep busy, that's for sure. <laughs> so, um, your book is called Captured by the Enemy. Yes. Here it is. Captured by the Enemy. And can you tell us a little bit about... Um, it, the book is about your grandfather. It is. During World War II. Yes. And he was, can you tell us a little bit about him and what happened? And yeah, absolutely. I, my granddad, uh, my father's father, had been in World War II. And as we were growing up, it was something that I was very interested in. Uh, he, my granddad would not talk about it when my dad was young, but as he got older, he began to tell more stories. And I just was fascinated by his stories. And we had been given a memoir that he had written uh, after World War II that had a lot of his capture experiences in it. And I found it fascinating. It was, I, I, even at a young age, I was probably sixth or seventh grade, I wanted to learn as much about it as possible. Uh, when I got older and I was doing reports for college, I decided to research the history that went along with his story and, and try to put it together. And, and as I did that, I was amazed by how the stories went together with the history. His memory was so clear and he remembered dates and people and names of things and so i was able to research it and start putting the history together with his story and that's how the book actually came about so i wanted to research the history add it into his story and research all the records that went along with it so that's how it came about excuse me so you're um that, that must have been absolutely fascinating to you as a young girl to hear all these stories of faraway places like North Africa and Italy and, you know, all these places that sound so exotic. Yeah, it, it was interesting because I didn't really realize the depth of it until I started doing the research. So when I started putting things together and realizing that he had landed in North Africa, to me, I didn't know that that was part of the history that went with his story. So I was able to completely retrace those steps, and it was fascinating to put it together. And how did your grandpa feel about it? I mean, I I don't. Um, the audience, okay. You and I have some personal history behind some of this because our families grew up near each other right uh, in council grove kansas so for all of you who live in council grove kansas and you knew carl good you know who we're talking about <laughs> all right um, so um what how did how did carl feel about having you write all this up about him he when I first asked him, he was not open to the idea of having a book written about him. He said he hadn't done anything special, that he was just one of the boys, mm -hmm. that the ones who fought and died were the real heroes, and he 
didn't feel like there was anything special about what he had done. And I kept on him and I would interview him and I would record his stories as much as possible. And the more I got into it, uh, the more I was convinced that this really needed to be a book. And eventually he did give me his consent that it would be okay. He still didn't really feel like he had done anything to deserve it, but that it would be okay to write the book if it was important to me, which it was. So I was able to go ahead with his permission and start on it more and putting the history together and and really turning it into what I felt would honor him for his service right and at the same time share his story right and I've I've read that before about other men from not just World War II but Vietnam and and other places that said the same thing your grandpa did that the real heroes were the ones who died Right. Uh, that, um, you know, and I'm sure your grandfather, as well as others, um, the ones who come back feel survivor's guilt because they think, well, why did I live? You know, right. Right. Others were, were as, as important as I was. So why, why did I come home? And they didn't. Right. Well, there is a lot of survivor's guilt or, surviving something that a lot of other people didn't right but and in his case he just said you know i didn't do anything i was just one of the boys i did what i was supposed to do i mm -hmm. I, I was there because that was the place i was supposed to be right right now you have uh you've done lots of book signings and so forth did you have some stuff there that you wanted to share that um you could read to us or anything yeah i actually i pulled out um his original memoir that he had written. Uh, his, of course, was handwritten. And right. then my maternal grandmother, as a gift to the family, had taken the time to have it written out. And nice. that we could have a copy for the family only. Now, this is a copy that has not been outside of the family. It's just something that we have. And, and even when I did the book, I used his words and I used a lot of his information but right. I didn't publish it with the book. And uh, and it is just, I can read, did you want to go over with, through his, after his escape? Yeah, let's go over that. Um, do you want me to read this part in chapter? We have temporary difficulties, folks. There she is. It, Rebooted or something. Did you want me to read this from chapter 12? A narrow escape from narrow escape. Are you there, Crystal? The joys of technology. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear? My, did you hear my question? Uh, I heard if you if you would like to read that. OK. <laughs> if you want to read some of that and then I will and then I will show you on my end the information that I had and then how I connected it okay that sounds good so chapter 12 we start on page 206 and it says immediately Captain Miller began treatments as he handed Carl a cup with purple liquid and said in his British accent here have a gargle with this it didn't look so bad but when he put it in his mouth he gagged it tasted rotten. It took every ounce of self-discipline not immediately to spit it out. Noticing his reaction, Captain Miller put his hand on his shoulder and said, not to worry, mate, you'll get used to it. He didn't know about that, but as the days passed, it was helping his throat heal. Although he still wasn't able to take advantage of the full portions in the hospital area, he was gaining his strength back. After 10 days, he could even eat the bread if he soaked it in his soup to make it soft enough to swallow. He was getting well enough that Captain Miller told him to come back every third day instead of every day. Grateful for the good doctor's help, he walked back to his barrack. In a week and a half, he was getting a good idea of how things worked at the camp. The next evening, he slowly walked outside with a group of buddies he had come to trust. Along with Tucker and Kingsland, there was Joseph Altamari, 
James Jim Snodgrass and James Jim Martelli. They all agreed escape would be the only way out and it filled their minds. In mid-sentence, Carl stopped talking and held up his hand. Do you guys hear that? I'll stop there and let you pick it up. Okay. Um, now, the way that I, like I said, I had interviewed him for hours and I recorded his interviews and then I would write, write it out so I could use those stories in, in my book. So some of the stories come directly from his memoir, others come directly from his interviews. Um, so to go along with what you read, I will actually go a little bit before that to what had happened um, so that you can see how the information went together. Uh, and the really cool part about that was I was able to connect with a few people in England and a few people in Italy. And between the two of them, they really were able to give me a lot of information. So when I was writing in a British accent, I would send that to the people I had connected with me and say, hey, can you check this and make sure that it could read as being a British accent? They were able to give me some suggestions to help with that. Whole history about uh, about what had happened uh, at that camp, and so we knew exactly who was the doctor and what happened, and then we went with his stories. So the reason why he had to take that liquid was um, he had been at a POW camp, and I will read here. He said that he talks about being in one of the POW camps and then coming in trying to get volunteers to go fill up craters. And he didn't want to have anything to do with that. He felt if they wanted their bomb craters filled, then they shouldn't be bombing. Or they should not be there in the first place. So um, he said one day they came in after volunteers to go fill up bomb craters for them for double rations. The first day they got a few. No, not me. I felt if they didn't want them there, let them give up. So, so it did a lot of others feel that way. And the next day we had the, the rest talked out of the notion of working. This went on until August 25th, 1943, around one o'clock. Our planes came over and bombed an ammunition jump, dump just a few hundred yards from camp, getting too close for our comfort. Yes, quite a bit too close. They got a direct hit on it and when it went up, I was thrown about halfway across the barracks with others at the same speed compression. It took the windows all out and the ends of the barracks were blown out. Some of the artillery shells took the roofs off the latrines, PXs, and barracks. This lasted all afternoon. I got in a drain ditch and stayed there until I knew it was safe to get out. So did the rest. There wasn't enough to go around for all and we kept close to old Mother Earth. I didn't have any doubt of any man forgetting to make a hearty prayer either. My throat got so sore I couldn't eat anything but liquid and it was too sore for that. I ran a fever along with a heavy nosebleed, and the right side of my head became as sore as a boil. I was taken to the hospital. Believe me, we became plenty jumpy when those planes came in hearing distance. I put three days in the hospital without much recovery. Then we were moved to another camp in northern Italy. We had to walk to a train station about 12 or 13 kilometers. I was so weak I could hardly go. It was hot as we walked, and I could feel myself giving out. Finally, we got about a half a mile from there. And one of my buddies took the box of stuff I was carrying. I was falling to the rear, man by man. Right then, death would have been a pleasure, but not to their satisfaction. The station grew within a few yards, and I was completely gone. I felt, but managed to get there. A couple of prisoners helped me onto the train, a box car, and gave me some water. I stretched out on the floor in a comfortable, in a comfortable position as I could get, as it was so crowded. A comfortable position was impossible. I tried to eat, but just couldn't swallow anything but soft foods, and that was hard to me. We were locked in the cars and moved on north. We stopped in a big railroad yard for nearly all night. The guards locked us in the cars and got out themselves, so if our planes came over, they would have a reasonable chance. This isn't a very happy feeling, though those planes didn't show up that night. Thank God for that. The next day, we arrived at our new camp, Marceretta number 59. Here we met more prisoners. 
This camp was the best I'd been in. It wasn't no place to call home, more lice, still the same rent, Russian. Water was limited. Didn't know what a shower was hardly. Get one every two weeks if we were lucky. I went to the hospital for treatments for about 10 days straight and started every third day. I was in this camp for two weeks. And it was at that camp that he received the medicine. So when he got that medicine, he uh, that was for those 10 days that he was there. So at the end of the chapter before where you read, I included the part about the bombing. And then he told us about the medicine and, and him being in the camp 59. Because he remembered what camp it was, I was able to go online and actually there's a site for Camp 59 called really? Campo And I was able to connect with the guy who actually runs that site. And he has a lot of stories of different things of, from prisoners in Camp 59. And through his stories, he was able to find Italians who had told stories about it as well. We were able to connect with who the doctor was, what was happening inside, and connect the, this is the camp that he was going to be able to escape from. And we were able to connect those stories all together. So it was really, really fun. That is <laughs> fascinating. That's, that's amazing that, you know, all this, I mean, wow. That's a lot of history then that's been preserved that would otherwise be gone. Yeah. Yeah, and that was the really fun part was making all these connections. Right. Now, yeah, you connected with some descendants of um, some of the other men, right? Yes. Could you tell us yes, about those? The people he was with when he escaped from camp, uh, we have an idea of who they were. Of course, they split off. They, they escaped in a group of six, and then they split off into groups of two because six was too many to try to get food for. Right. And um, he separated with a man by the name of Jim Martelli. And I, he wasn't in very good, good condition when they got home from the war. And... I wasn't able to connect with him. In fact, I did find an obituary. I'm not sure if it was the same person, but it seemed to be um, and saying that he had passed away in the 1970s. Oh, right. So I wasn't able to connect with his descendants, but there were other people in the story. As I said, I had worked with people from Italy and from England while I was putting it together. And I was able to connect names that my granddad had given me, and they were able to connect them with people in the area that indeed had helped prisoners. And so one of the people I was able to connect with was a story that my granddad had told of um, a young boy who had served in the Italian military, and he had been in Greece, and he was shot in the jaw. And so they sent him home. And he didn't want to just be at home not doing anything for the fight. And so he joined a group. There were lots of groups in the mountains that were fighting for free Italy. And he was a partisan. And he was fighting in the mountains with a group. And he didn't live too far away from where my granddad and Jim were hiding out. They were always moving because they couldn't stay in one place for a long time. Right. But they in the general area because they had people there who were helping them and they would help their families in return they did farming and they did other things to help these families in return and uh, whenever they could right and and uh, one of the so the guy who was a partisan his name was ricardo finari and That's he true. lived in a mount kind in the mountain they were in the mountains italy was really rough terrain to be in um, and so they were in a mountain area close to Mar uh, San Martino, um, okay. Monte San Martino, which is San Martino Mountain. And they would, uh, they didn't stay close to the town of Monte San Martino, but they were in, in the mountains behind, close by. And um, Ricardo's family lived in the mountains as well. And so whenever Ricardo would come back to do recruitment or to visit his family, he would visit with my granddad and Jim 
who were hiding out and they had an area in the ditch that they had made into a little um, covering where they could hide out and it was one place they could go and, and be pretty protected from the roads and they could still see what was going on around them. And uh, the fascists eventually caught up with Ricardo and they killed him in front of his house. Mm -hmm. And my granddad and Jim were in the ditch when it happened and they peeked out and they could see the house across the road and they saw it as it had happened. Mm -hmm. So I was able to connect with Ricardo's family because Ricardo had a brother named Umberto and Umberto had a son who he named Ricardo. And Ricardo um, lived in Argentina. They had moved to Argentina after the war. So he was in Argentina, but he had a daughter who went back to Italy and she was in a relationship in Italy. And so she lived right there in that area. Right. So she, was, she had done, um, it, it was an exchange program that England offers to families in Italy whose families helped with the war effort during that time. And so she had done an exchange in England and I was able to find her and her dad, Ricardo, on Facebook and become friends with them and get information from them. And that was really neat. And Vanessa, the daughter of Ricardo, had sent me pictures of the area where they were hiding out in. And I actually, I have a couple of pictures. Let me grab them. I don't know if you can see this well, because they're large posters. And I use these in my presentations. So. For them, of course, they were very weak and sick when they had escaped, but um, this is the area that he would have been in. This is the Monte San Martino area. And um, he would have been hiding here in, in the mountain area. And then Vanessa also was able to send me pictures of the, of, this is the area directly where he would have been hiding around in the ditch. Of course, it's changed a lot. <laughs> in right. Six years, you know, the terrain is different. But it gives us a good idea of what it looked like. And this is actually the house where Ricardo was killed, that Ricardo was killed in front of. So the fact that found him and lined him up in front of the house with his mom on one side, his dad on the other, his brother, and then they killed Ricardo only. And that was kind of mm. punishment to the family because he was helping. Yeah, he was a, a fighter for the Italians. So I was real. These pictures are just you get an idea of where they were and what they were doing and what the terrain would have looked like. And I was just really, it was really, really neat to be able to connect with them. Yeah, that is so fascinating that you were even able to find them. I mean, in all the world, seven billion people, and you find them. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that was that was just it was really really it was a neat experience for me. Oh, yeah. uh, I was able to connect with them. We were able to share stories, and in fact, one of the guys who was always with Ricardo's name was Gino, and I found him. He was still alive when I published, which was in 2015, and um, I had written an email. His sister-in-law got a hold of me or his, maybe it was his daughter-in-law, but one of his family members got a hold of me and said, Gino is still alive. He remembers your grandfather. He would like you to come to Rome and speak with him. And I would have loved to go to Rome to speak with him. <laughs> but of course, mm -hmm. it hasn't been something that I've been able to do yet. But, and I, and I, still, I haven't heard anything since then. So uh -huh. he, he would be, he would be an older gentleman by this point and, um, I'm just not sure if if he's still there in Rome or if or not. Or if the if invitation is, still stands. Yeah, yeah. I would love to go and talk with Dino. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Or even his children, because they have to have the stories their grandfather told. I mean, their father yeah. told. Ugly, yeah. Right. <laughs> 
So that's, that's just fascinating, Crystal. I'm so glad you wrote the book to honor your grandfather because too many people don't do that. They don't, you know, they just, especially as grandchildren, sometimes you, you get into the idea that oh, grandpa and his old stories again, you know, but I wished I had written down my grandfather's stories. Right. Well, and I learned so much when I started doing it. I really did. I, from the way I decided to write the book, I wanted to include a little bit about his before the war and a little bit about after the war. And I learned so much about his life that I just didn't know. And right. so I was really glad that I had taken the opportunity to get those stories because he did pass away in 2011 and my book wasn't finished until 2015. So he didn't get to see it completed, but uh, I had, he knew I was working on it and it was just, it took a long time to put all the research and the stories together in the way that I had chosen to write it. So um, it did take a while, but it got done. <laughs> As good stories often do, you know, it, it yeah. takes, you know, I mean, so you think, oh, this won't take long. Well, mm, wrong. Um, <laughs> So I know I talked to your dad and he was saying how he took you to talk to other veteran, you know, veterans that, that would have served around the same time your, your grandfather did. And, you know, the research you put into that, to that book was amazing. Yeah, it, it was, I was able to order his army reports and uh, know exactly how they traveled and where they were at different points in time based on dates and then connect his stories and then take other people's stories who had written about the same areas and recreate the whole scenario. So I knew if somebody else had said it was, you know, if there's a war book, um, Eisenhower actually had a book that was around that time. It gave a lot of weather information as far as it was muddy and it was wet and it was raining. And I was able to, because I knew where they were traveling when, I was able to connect these dates and recreate it. Right. So it was, it was, uh, it was a really awesome experience. It sounds like it. It's, you know, but I, I can only, I just am in awe that that, you know, for a first time author, that's a huge undertaking, you know, to, to get all that research done and you know now you probably use NARA and NARA to do a lot of your research right I use a lot of different sources mm -hmm. um, for my research I used army records right. and then um, I used a lot of books in fact I have all my research books right here the one I actually used the most was this one and um, and it was operations in North Africa waters. And this gave a lot of the detailed information that I needed. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able just to outline as they, you can see here, I was able to outline different scenarios, different things that were happening in his areas. Mm -hmm. and, it, and that's how I was able to connect the history. And so, mm -hmm. but I used resources from everywhere. I, I used online resources. I used lots of books. I have two of these books that were by Samuel Morrison that I used, and um, one for Sicily landing and then one for the North Africa landing. And find the name of his operation, since I knew what operation he was in and the date. I was able to go through and find information on those operations specifically. And then I was able to combine it all together. It was, it was a large undertaking, but yeah, I, I just, I used every resource out there that I could. <laughs> and that's good. That's, that's what a good research, you know, author does. They use everything they can get their hands on and then weed out what they don't need and, it's just a vast undertaking, and I'm proud of you. Thank you. And it did end up, even though it is a 350-page book, uh, believe it or not, that is the cut version. <laughs> I did cut it a lot. On but... sure. <laughs> sure. Otherwise, you would have been writing for forever. 
Yeah, it could have. I really could have. I just had so much wonderful information to go on. His stories and his memoir made it for me. Uh, based on the information and the dates he gave me, uh, it wasn't as challenging as it could have been. Right. Yeah, because so. sometimes people are real vague and. Right. Right. You know, but but you're you know Carl was so good at that apparently. Yeah. Oh, and even when he was. 90 years old, he could still tell you names and dates and who was there. And it was amazing. Well, it was so obviously did, an experience that uh, you don't forget easily. Yeah. It's, well, that is very true. Very true. So, yeah. And, and I know that there are a lot of, I, I've heard other people that had fathers and, and mothers too. Moms fought in wars too. Um, right. But we think more often of it being the men, but women served as nurses and jeep drivers and all kinds of things during World War II as well. It wasn't just Rosie the Riveter, folks. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it was just, oh, <laughs> Lisa has a question for you. Let me bring her on. Let me. I'm not really forgetting you, Lisa. <laughs> Well, there she comes. Hi. Hi, Lisa. Well, that was really fun. Thank you for sharing. I can't wait to read the book. I Ever since I started this group, <laughs> I've got a list now of about 35 books. Oh, I bet. I bet. And I've got to learn how to speed read because I'm the slowest reader in all the universe. <laughs> but, but anyway... Um, so I have a question. Um, when was the first time that you decided you wanted to write this book? Because I, can, I can't even imagine. I heard stories from my grandfather about things, but I have to admit, it never popped into my head to take on a Herculean you know, action like this. I, I really am ad admiring your, <laughs> your tenacity here. Thank you. Um I always loved it since I could read the memoir. I really, the memoir was so fascinating to me. And once I started connecting the history, it was just, I, I couldn't stop. And that, when I really started connecting the history with his words was in 2007. So, uh, but I always loved the story. And, and like I said, when my dad was younger, it wasn't to be talked about. Nobody was supposed to talk about his experiences or what happened mm -hmm. because he did have some post-traumatic stress disorder from right. his experiences. And my grandma especially wanted to protect him from those. Oh, wow. Because he didn't want anybody to talk about it to encourage or have him have an episode. So when my grandma passed away unexpectedly, it's when he really started opening up about that. And she... Um, he passed away, I want to say, in 1987. So we had a long, a big time frame where we could start asking questions. And he probably got tired of it because he did lots and lots of interviews for grandchildren. He went to schools and he spoke about it. And he really, he really embraced his past rather than trying to push it aside. Cool. Because a lot of a lot of times I've heard um, people who have uh, fathers, grandfathers that served in World War, well, in any war. It, it isn't even that specifically. But they will come home and they will just clam up. They won't talk about it at all. Yeah. Right. And getting them well, to talk about it is that. Ah. Well, yeah. Well, and that did happen with, we talked a little bit about the guy he was in the mountains with for nine months. Him and Jim had become really good friends by the end of it, they got when they made it to Allied Lines, uh, it was in 1944, at the end of it, they made it back, and before they separated, my granddad asked him for his address or something that he could get a hold of him, and he said, I don't want to remember this. I don't want any connections. I, do, I just want to put it behind me and move on. And... My granddad never did have connection with him again, hmm. but he just didn't. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to remember it. Hmm. He just wanted to move on with his life and forget mm -hmm. it ever happened. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever thought about starting a group for people to share their family stories? No. 
That's a good question. I hadn't thought of that myself. Yeah. yeah, it'd be cool to have other families preserve these type of memories. I, to me, one of the things I always think about is the how stories and skills are lost as we pass away. You know that all of the experiences of our life, we don't do as much um, family discussion as because I grew up in Ozark, Arkansas, and you know everything was. It, you'd go out on the porch in the evening and the grandparents would come by and you'd start talking and grandpa would show you how to do this and that. We, you know, we don't do that anymore. It's all, you know, all our interaction now is, well, you know, social media. But um, but the thing is, is that I, I find it quite intriguing and I always encourage people to like start trying to mine this information. So I, I, I really take my hat off to you for for data mining this and, and getting this into written form for all of us to enjoy, not just not just your family. So well, thank you. I had <laughs> well, well it looks like our time is just about up. Have we any last questions? Any anything from anybody? Is there anyone else? What's the next book? <laughs> What's, yeah, your yeah, your next book. <laughs> I, I actually have lots of ideas, but I haven't put anything. I haven't made anything solid yet. There, there was one line in the book that really stuck out to me. It's just the fact that he went off to war, he came back, and he came back with a lot of experiences that were really difficult for him. And but yet, if you see a person on the outside, you can't see that. You just see them, and they look like they're like any other person on the street. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for people to understand that every person is dealing with different struggles. And I have thought about trying to do something under those lines that just because you see a person doesn't mean that, well, in fact, most of the time, it does. they're not having a perfect life like it may appear. <laughs> Everybody's struggling with different things yeah. at different times. It could be divorce, it could be depression, it could be sickness. Right. There's so many things that people are dealing with all the time. And I don't think, we, we just don't think about it. Right. And I think it would be nice to open that up and learn from other people's experiences who have dealt with different trials and how they dealt with them. And so that other people can, can see that you know, they're not the only ones struggling and that it is, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. It may take a while to get there, but it's there. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. my husband works with a lot of uh, veterans with, and he's in the suicide department here in Las Vegas. And uh, it it is true that you don't see what's behind. And, you know, there's so much uh, challenge in the world, especially with all the stresses we have and everything. So it'd be very cool to have something something written about that to help us all understand to be less judgmental on things yeah yeah i think it really it, it just really struck a chord with me that you know you can see somebody from the outside and they look perfectly healthy or normal or happy mm -hmm. and a lot of times they are struggling with things that are a lot easier well we look forward to that next book <laughs> <laughs>